Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter Ten. The property is carried off. The February morning looked gray and drizzling through the window of Uncle Tom's Cabin. It looked on downcast faces, the images of mournful hearts. The little table stood out before the fire, covered with an ironing cloth. A coarse but clean shirt or two, fresh from the iron, hung on the back of a chair by the fire, and Aunt Chloe had another spread out before her on the table. Carefully she rubbed and ironed every fold and every hem with the most scrupulous exactness, every now and then raising her hand to her face to wipe off the tears that were coursing down her cheeks. Tom sat by with his testament open on his knee, and his head leaning upon his hand. But neither spoke. It was yet early, and the children lay all asleep together in their little rude trundle-bed. Tom, who had to the full the gentle domestic heart, which woe for them, has been a peculiar characteristic of his unhappy race, got up and walked silently to look at his children. "'It's the last time,' he said. Aunt Chloe did not answer, only rubbed away over and over on the coarse shirt, already as smooth as hands could make it, and finally, setting her iron suddenly down with a despairing plunge, she sat down to the table, and lifted up her voice and wept. "'Suppose we must be resigned. Oh, but, oh, Lord, how can I? If I'd known anything whar you're going, or, or how they'd sarve you, Mrs. says she'll try and deem you in a year or two. But, Lord, nobody never comes up that goes down thar. They kills em. I've hearn em tell how they works em up on them our plantations. There'll be the same God there, Cleo, that there is here. Well, said Aunt Cleo, suppose there will. But the Lord lets dreadful things happen sometimes. I don't seem to get no comfort that way. I'm in the Lord's hands, said Tom. Nothing can go no further than he lets it. And there's one thing I can thank him for. It's me that's sold and going down, and not you nor the children. Here you're safe. What comes will come only on me, and the Lord, he'll help me. I know he will. Ah, brave manly heart, smothering thine own sorrow to comfort thy beloved ones. Tom spoke with a thick utterance, and with a bitter choking in his throat, but he spoke brave and strong. "'Let's uh, think on our marcies,' he said tremulously, as if he was quite sure he needed to think on them very hard indeed. "'Marcies!' said Aunt Chloe. "'Don't see no marcies. Tain't right. Tain't right it should be so. Master never ought to left it so that he could be took for his debts. Eve aren't him all he gets for you twice over. He owed you your freedom, and ought to get to your years ago. Maybe he can't help himself now, but I feel it's wrong. Nothing can't beat that ire out of me. Such a faithful critter as you been, and allers sought his business for your own every way, and reckoned on him more than your own wife and chillin them as sells hearts love and hearts blood to get out thar scrapes de lord be up to em chloe now if you love me you won't talk so when perhaps just the last time we'll ever have together and i'll tell you chloe it goes agin me to hear one word agin massa what he put in my arms a baby it's nature i should think a heap of him and he couldn't be spected to think so much of poor tom Masses used to have an all days year things done for him, and natly they don't think so much on't. They can't be spected to no way. Set up alongside of other masses, who's had the treatment and livin' I've had? And he never would have let this yar come on me if he could have seen it aforehand. I know he wouldn't. Well, anyway, there's wrong about somewhere," said Chloe, in whom a stubborn sense of justice was a predominant trait. I can't just make out whar tis. But there's wrong somewhere. I'm clear on that. You ought to look up to the Lord above. He's above all. I don't a sparrow fall without him. You don't seem to comfort me, but I spect it order, said Aunt Chloe. But there's no use talk, and I'll just wet up the corn cake and get you one good breakfast, cause nobody knows when you'll get another. In order to appreciate the sufferings of the negroes sold south, it must be remembered that all the instinctive affections of that race are peculiarly strong. Their local attachments are very abiding. They are not naturally daring and enterprising, but home-loving and affectionate. 
add to this all the terrors with which ignorance invests the unknown, and add to this, again, that selling to the South is set before the negro from childhood as the last severity of punishment. The threat that terrifies more than whipping or torture of any kind is the threat of being sent down river. We have ourselves heard this feeling expressed by them, and seen the unaffected horror with which they will sit in their gossiping hours, and tell frightful stories of that down river, which to them is that undiscovered country from whose bourn no traveller returns. Note, a slightly inaccurate quotation from Hamlet, Act Three, Scene One, Lines 369 to 370. A missionary figure among the fugitives in Canada told us that many of the fugitives confessed themselves to have escaped from comparatively kind masters, and that they were induced to brave the perils of escape, in almost every case, by the desperate horror with which they regarded being sold south, a doom which was hanging either over themselves or their husbands, their wives or children. This nerves the African, naturally patient, timid, and unenterprising, with heroic courage, and leads him to suffer hunger, cold, pain, the perils of the wilderness, and the more dread penalties of recapture. The simple morning meal now smoked on the table, for Mrs. Shelby had excused Aunt Chloe's attendance at the great house that morning. The poor soul had expended all her little energies on this farewell feast, had killed and dressed her choicest chicken and prepared her corn-cake with scrupulous exactness, just to her husband's taste, and brought out certain mysterious jars on the mantelpiece, some preserves that were never produced except on extreme occasions. "'Lor, Pete,' said Mose, triumphantly, "'hadn't we got a buster of a breakfast?' at the same time catching at a fragment of the chicken. Aunt Chloe gave him a sudden box on the ear. "'There now, crowing over the last breakfast your poor daddy's going to have to home.' "'Oh, Chloe,' said Tom gently. "'Well, I can't help it,' said Aunt Chloe, hiding her face in her apron. "'I'm so tossed about it, it makes me act ugly.' The boys stood quite still, looking first at their father and then at their mother, while the baby, climbing up her clothes, began an imperious, commanding cry. "'There!' said Aunt Chloe, wiping her eyes and taking up the baby. "'Now I's done, I hope. Now do eat something. This here is my nicest chicken.' "'Thar, boys, you shall have some, poor critters. Your mammy's been cross to you.' The boys needed no second invitation, and went in with great zeal for the eatables. And it was well they did so, as otherwise there would have been very little performed to any purpose by the party. "'Now,' said Aunt Chloe, bustling about after breakfast, "'I must put up your clothes. Just like as not, he'll take em all away. I know their ways, mean as dirt they is. Well, now, your flannels for rheumatiz is in this corner, so be careful, cause there won't nobody make you no more. Then here's your old shirts, and these yer is new ones. I towed off these your stockings last night, and put the ball in them to mend with, but lor, who'll ever mend for you? And Aunt Chloe, again overcome, laid her head on the box side and sobbed. To think on it, no critter to do for you, sick or well. I don't really think I ought to be good now. The boys, having eaten everything there was on the breakfast-table, began now to take some thought of the case, and seeing their mother crying and their father looking very sad, began to whimper and put their hand to their eyes. Uncle Tom had the baby on his knee and was letting her enjoy herself to the utmost extent, scratching his face and pulling his hair, and occasionally breaking out into clamorous explosions of delight, evidently arising out of her own internal reflections. "'Ah, crow away, poor critter,' said Aunt Chloe. "'You'll have to come to it, too. You'll live to see your husband sold, or maybe be sold yourself. And these yer boys, they's to be sold, I suppose, too, just like as not. When day gets good for something, ain't no use in niggers having nothing.' Here one of the boys called out, "'There's Mrs. a-comin' in. She can't do no good. What's she coming for?' said Aunt Chloe. Mrs. Shelby entered. Aunt Chloe set a chair for her in a manner decidedly gruff and crusty. She did not seem to notice either the action or the manner. She looked pale and anxious. "'Tom,' she said, "'I come to—' And stopping suddenly, and regarding the silent group, she sat down in the chair, and covering her face with her handkerchief, began to sob. "'Lord, now, Mrs. Don't—' "'Don't!' said Aunt Chloe, bursting out in her turn, and for a few moments they all wept in company and in those tears they all shed together, the high and the lowly, 
melted away all the heart-burnings and anger of the oppressed. O oh, ye who visit the distressed! Do ye know that everything your money can buy, given with a cold, averted face, is not worth one honest tear shed in real sympathy? My good fellow, said Mrs. Shelby, I can't give you anything to do you any good. If I give you money, it will only be taken from you. But I tell you solemnly and before God that I will keep trace of you, and bring you back as soon as I can command the money. Until then, trust in God. Here the boys called out that Massa Haley was coming, and then an unceremonious kick pushed open the door. Haley stood there in very ill humor, having ridden hard the night before, and being not at all pacified by his ill success in recapturing his prey. Come, said he, ye nigger, ye're ready. Servant, ma'am, said he, taking off his hat as he saw Mrs. Shelby. Aunt Chloe shut and corded the box, and getting up, looked gruffly on the trader, her tears seeming suddenly turned to sparks of fire. Tom rose up meekly to follow his new master, and raised up his heavy box on his shoulder. His wife took the baby in her arms to go with him to the wagon, and the children, still crying, trailed on behind. Mrs. Shelby, walking up to the trader, detained him for a few moments, talking with him in an earnest manner, and while she was thus talking the whole family party proceeded to a wagon that stood ready harnessed at the door. A crowd of all the old and young hands on the place stood gathered around it to bid farewell to their old associate. Tom had been looked up to, both as a head-servant and a Christian teacher, by all the place, and there was much honest sympathy and grief about him particularly among the women. "'Why, Chloe, you buy it better'n we do,' said one of the women, who had been weeping freely, noticing the gloomy calmness with which Aunt Chloe stood by the wagon. "'I's done my tears,' she said, looking grimly at the trader, who was coming up. "'I does not feel to cry for dat o' our old limb, nohow.' "'Get in,' said Haley to Tom, as he strode through the crowd of servants who looked at him with lowering brows. Tom got in, and Haley— drawing out from under the wagon seat a heavy pair of shackles, made them fast around each ankle. A smothered groan of indignation ran through the whole circle, and Mrs. Shelby spoke from the veranda. "'Mr. Haley, I assure you that precaution is entirely unnecessary.' "'Don't know, ma'am. I've lost one five hundred dollars from this yar place, and I can't afford to run no more risks.' "'What else could she spect on him?' said Aunt Chloe indignantly, while the two boys, who now seemed to comprehend at once their father's destiny, clung to her gown, sobbing and growing vehemently. "'I'm sorry,' said Tom, "'that Massa George happened to be away.' George had gone to spend two or three days with a companion on a neighboring estate, and having departed early in the morning, before Tom's misfortune had been made public, had left without hearing of it. "'Give my love to Massa George,' he said earnestly. Haley whipped up the horse, and, with a steady, mournful look, fixed to the last on the old place, Tom was whirled away. Mr. Shelby at this time was not at home. He had sold Tom under the spur of a driving necessity to get out of the power of a man whom he dreaded, and his first feeling after the consummation of the bargain had been that of relief— but his wife's expostulations awoke his half-slumbering regrets, and Tom's manly disinterestedness increased the unpleasantness of his feelings. It was in vain that he said to himself that he had a right to do it, that everybody did it, and that some did it without even the excuse of necessity. He could not satisfy his own feelings, and that he might not witness the unpleasant scenes of the consummation he had gone on a short business tour up the country hoping that all would be over before he returned. Tom and Haley rattled on along the dusty road, whirling past every old familiar spot, until the bounds of the estate were fairly passed, and they found themselves out on the open pike. After they had ridden about a mile, Haley suddenly drew up at the door of a blacksmith's shop, when, taking out with him a pair of handcuffs, he stepped into the shop to have a little alteration in them. "'These here is a little too small for his build,' said Haley, showing the fetters, and pointing out to Tom. "'Lor, now, if thar ain't Shelby's Tom! He hadn't sold him, now,' said the smith. "'Yes, he has,' said Haley. "'Now you don't! Well, really,' said the smith. "'Who'd have thought it? Why, you needn't go to fetterin' him up this yar way. 
He's the faithfulest, best creeter. Yes, yes, said Haley. But your good fellers are just the critter to want her run off. Them stupid ones as don't care where they go, and shiftless drunken ones as don't care for nothing, they'll stick by, and like as not be rather pleased to be toted around. But days ye are prime fellers, they hates it like sin. No way but to fetter em. Got legs? They'll use em, no mistake. Well, said the smith, feeling among his tools, them plantations down thar, stranger, ain't just the place a Kentuck nigger wants to go to. They dies thar tolerable fast, don't they? Well, yes, tolerable fast they're, they're dying is. What with the clematin' and one thing another, and, and they dies so as to keep the market up pretty brisk, said Haley. Well, a feller can't help thinking it's a mighty pity to have a nice, quiet, likely feller, as good as an as Tom is, go down to be fairly ground up on one of them thar sugar plantations. Well, he's got a far chance. I promise to do well by him. I'll get him in house servant in some good old family, and then, if he stands the fever and clematin, he'll have a berth good as any nigger ought to ask for. He leaves his wife and chillin up there, I suppose. Yes, see, he'll get another thar. Lord, thar's women enough everywhere, said Haley. Tom was sitting very mournfully on the outside of the shop while this conversation was going on. Suddenly he heard the quick, short click of a horse's hoof behind him, and before he could fairly awake from his surprise, young Master George sprang into the wagon, threw his arms tumultuously round his neck, and was sobbing and scolding with energy. "'I declare it's real mean. I don't care what they say, any of them. It's a nasty, mean shame. If I was a man, they shouldn't do it. They should not. So,' said George, with a kind of subdued howl. "'Oh, Massa George, this does me good.' said Tom. I couldn't bar to go off without seeing you. It does me real good. He can't tell. Here Tom made some movement of his feet, and George's eye fell on the fetters. What a shame! he exclaimed, lifting his hands. I'll knock that old fellow down, I will. No, you won't, Massa George. And you must not talk so loud. It won't help me any to anger him. Well, I won't, then, for your sake. But only to think of it. Isn't it a shame? They never sent for me, nor sent me any word, and if it hadn't been for Tom Lincoln, I shouldn't have heard it. I tell you, I blew em up well, all of em at home. Ah, uh, I wasn't right, I feared, Master Tom. Can't help it, I say it's a shame. Look here, Uncle Tom, said he, turning his back to the shop and speaking in a mysterious tone. I've brought you my dollar. Oh, I wouldn't think of taking on't, Master George. No ways in the world, said Tom, quite moved. But you shall take it, said George. Look here, I told Aunt Chloe I'd do it, and she advised me just to make a hole in it and put a string through it so you would hang it round your neck and keep it out of sight, else this mean scamp would take it away. I tell you, Tom, I want to blow him up. It would do me good. No, don't, Master George, for it won't do me any good. Well, I won't, for your sake, said George, busily tying his dollar round Tom's neck. But there, now, button your coat tight over it, and keep it, and remember, every time you see it, that I'll come down after you and bring you back. Aunt Chloe and I have been talking about it, and I told her not to fear. I'll see to it, and I'll tease father's life out if he don't do it. Oh, Massa George, you mustn't talk so about your father. Lord, Uncle Tom, I don't mean anything bad. And now, Massa George, said Tom, you must be a good boy. Remember how many hearts is sought on you. Always keep close to your mother. Don't be getting into any of them foolish ways boys has of getting too big to mind their mothers. Tell you what, Massa George, the Lord gives good many things twice over, but he won't give you a mother but once. You'll never see such another woman, Massa George, if you live to be a hundred years old. So now you hold on to her and grow up and be a comfort to her. There's my own good boy. You will now, won't you? Yes, I will, Uncle Tom, said George seriously. And be careful o' your speaking, Massa George. Young boys, when it comes to your age, is willful sometimes. It is nature they should be. But real gentlemen, such as I hope you'll be, never lets fall on words that isn't respectful to their parents. You ain't fended, Massa George. No, indeed, Uncle Tom, you always did give me good advice. I's older, you know, said Tom, stroking the boy's fine curly head with his large, strong hand, but speaking in a voice as tender as a woman's. And I sees all that's bound up in you. Oh, Massa George, you has everything. Larnin', privileges, 
readin, writin, and you'll grow up to be a great, learned, good man, and all the people on the place, and your mother and father, be so proud on you. Be a good massa, like your father, and be a Christian, like your mother. Remember your crater in the days of your youth, Massa George. I'll be real good, Uncle Tom, I tell you, said George. I'm going to be a first raider, and don't you be discouraged. I'll have you back to the place yet. As I told Aunt Chloe this morning, I'll build our house all over, and you shall have a room for a parlor with a carpet on it when I'm a man. Oh, you'll have good times yet. Haley now came to the door with the handcuffs in his hands. Look here now, mister, said George, with an air of great superiority as he got out. I shall let father and mother know how you treat Uncle Tom. You're welcome, said the trader. I should think you'd be ashamed to spend all your life buying men and women and chaining them like cattle. I should think you'd feel mean, said George. So long as your grand folks wants to buy men and women, I'm as good as they is, said Haley. Tain't any meaner sellin' on em than tis buyin'. I'll never do either when I'm a man, said George. I'm ashamed this day that I'm a Kentuckian. I always was proud of it before. And George sat very straight on his horse and looked round with an air, as if he expected the state would be impressed with his opinion. Well, good-bye, Uncle Tom. Keep a stiff upper lip, said George. Good-bye, Master George, said Tom, looking fondly and admiringly at him. God Almighty bless you. Ah, Kentucky hadn't got many like you, he said, in the fullness of his heart, as the frank, boyish face was lost to his view. Away he went, and Tom looked, till the clatter of his horse's heels died away, the last sound or sight of his home. But over his heart there seemed to be a warm spot, where those young hands had placed that precious dollar. Tom put up his hand, and held it close to his heart. "'Now, I tell you what, Tom,' said Haley, as he came up to the wagon, and threw in the handcuffs, "'I mean to start far with you, as I generally do with my niggers. But I'll tell you now, to begin with, you treat me far, and I'll treat you far. I ain't never hard on my niggers. Calculates to do the best for em I can. Now, you see, you better just settle down comfortable, and not be trying no tricks, because niggers' tricks of all sorts I'm up to, and it's no use. If niggers is quiet and don't try to get off, they has good times with me. And if they don't, why, it's their fault and not mine." Tom assured Haley that he had no present intentions of running off. In fact, the exhortation seemed rather a superfluous one to a man with a great pair of iron fetters on his feet. But Mr. Haley had got in the habit of commencing his relations with his stock with little exhortations of this nature, calculated, as he deemed, to inspire cheerfulness and confidence, and prevent the necessity of any unpleasant scenes. And here, for the present, we take our leave of Tom, to pursue the fortunes of other characters in our story. End of chapter 10